Good morning. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures, commonly referred to as the King James Version. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures and follow me along in the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Follow me along, read with me word for word, verse by verse. Follow me along, make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Follow me along, make sure I'm not lying to you and taking things out of context. Please follow me along, okay? We're going to begin today in 2 Timothy chapter 3, just two verses to start, because we are going to be primarily within the Old Testament today, looking at some things for 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God is the author of the scriptures. He used man's hand, but he is the author of the scripture. And is profitable for doctrine. How someone is made right with God within the current dispensation. For reproof. For correction. For instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. A lot of people seem to, to confuse doctrine for instruction in righteousness and instruction in righteousness for doctrine. Doctrine is pertinent unto the dispensation, whatever which one it is. Today we are in the dispensation of the time of the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles have been grafted into the tree of the Jew. Okay? So within this dispensation today, you are saved by his grace through your faith. Okay? By his grace. And the answer to his grace is your faith. Okay? And we are saved by coming to him on his terms. Broken of our self-righteousness. Thinking that you're a good person and you can save yourself having godly sorrow because it, after all it is your fault your reason why you're the reason why he died on that cross and having the third of fearing the Lord because if he doesn't save you and you are not right with him through his salvation that he gives to you because it is a gift uh, he's going to send you to hell and because you fear the Lord and because you are broken of your self-righteousness and have godly sorrow, contrition, and you fear him, that will lead you to call, call upon his name. Ask him to forgive you. Okay? That is doctrine for today. Okay? But instruction in righteousness, to teach, to instruct us how we are to adhere to whose righteousness? Ours? No. His. And how do we do that? Looking within the doctrines, within the scriptures that are pertinent onto not only this dispensation, but those of the past, other dispensations. Why? Verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, not sinlessly perfect, perfect with through your relationship and heart with God, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And when the Lord saves us, we are called unto good works, not to be saved, not to stay saved, but being as ambassadors for Christ, okay? Having the uh, ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation, okay? So we are to read the scriptures, number one for doctrine, number two for proof, number four for correction. Uh, number three for correction and number four for instruction and in righteousness. Okay? And of course, and why? So that we may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay? And also too, Romans chapter 15, just one verse. We have to remind people of this, brethren. We have to remind people of this. You've heard this countless times. You're going to hear it again. Okay? Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning 
that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Hmm. So today, dear friends, brethren, we are going to be looking into the scriptures for our instruction in righteousness. This is a collaborated effort. This is a collaborated effort. Uh, my dear, my best friend and I um, spake yesterday. Um, please keep my best friend Alexander Hartley in your prayers, please. Uh, but we spake yesterday and the Lord just opened up the scriptures uh, for the both of us. And um, it was very, 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 very rewarding unto us. Our text that we are going to be looking at is going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 25. 2 Chronicles chapter 25. We are going to be examining a little bit of the life of Amaziah. The life of Amaziah. Okay? The life of Amaziah. Amaziah, who was the king of Joash. Okay? And you're going to see that another Joash is mentioned within the text that we are going to be looking at. Okay? But um, the uh, Amaziah was the son of Joash, who was the king of Judah. And within the text that we are going to be reading, you are going to see a Joash mentioned, who is a totally different Joash, who is the king of Israel. You know, there were two, two, uh, two kingdoms. There was the king of uh, the kingdom of basically Israel that encompassed most of the tribes, and then there was the kingdom of Judah that was Judah and Benjamin. Okay, so you got to remember that. But we're going to be reading predominantly the entire chapter, and we are, we're going to have some points that we're going to look at along the way. And the question we want to consider: there are going to be several questions that we are going to consider. Number one, how many chances, and how many warnings does a man get? What are the circumstances that surround God's long-suffering and chances that he gives? Okay, what, what, um, what circumstances may there be? And also, what is it about these little g-gods that will make even godly kings lust after them. Let's find out. Second Chronicles chapter 25. Let us begin at verse 1. Second Chronicles chapter 25. We're going to begin at verse 1 and we're going to read up to verse 10 to begin. Amaziah was twenty and five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But, but, not with a perfect heart. A perfect heart. A perfect heart that loved the Lord, that belonged unto the Lord, that feared the Lord. Solomon, at first, seemingly had a perfect heart, didn't he? But his heart got turned away because of uh, the multitude of the women that he was with. Okay, So Solomon's heart wasn't perfect until the, uh, in the latter years of his life. Whereas David, who messed up, who sinned, yes, his heart was perfect with the Lord unto his death. Okay? All right. You got to remember, at the time that we are looking at, this was under the dispensation of the law. And under the law, it was faith and works. Eternal security was not there. The permanent seal of God himself, the Holy Ghost, Lord Jesus Christ, you know, our Father, the Lord is that spirit, dwelling within you, was not within this dispensation. And this is why a lot of the heretics out there like to go to the, New, to the Old Testament to show works salvation. Okay, that, you know, or, or, or in order to scare people to do certain things, okay? Because in this dispensation, the Holy Ghost could come and go, come and go, okay? And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, 
but not with a perfect heart. Now it came to pass, when the kingdom was established to him, that he slew his servants that had killed the king his father. Talking about Joash, his father, who was brought up by Je uh, Je uh, uh, Jehoiada, the priest. And once the priest was dead, when Jehoiada, the priest, was dead, then Joash kind of went astray in a big way. And people conspired against him and killed him. You can read, read chapter 24 on your own time, okay? Now it came to pass when the kingdom was established to him that he slew his servants that had killed the king his father. But he slew not their children, but did as it is written in the law of the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not, be, shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for their fathers, but every man shall die for his own sin. Yes, every one of us is going to give an account of himself to God. Okay? You yourself personally are going to give an account to God for everything you have done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Where are you going to do that at? At the great white throne of judgment? Or at the judgment seat of Christ? Which one? Okay? Verse 4, noting responsibility and accountability for one's actions. Not, being, not doing, hey, it was her fault. The, you know, the woman that thou gavest me, she gave me of the tree, or it's this guy's fault for what? No, 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 no. You are responsible for yourself. And that was even taught in the Old Testament. Let's continue. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, according to the houses of their fathers throughout all Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom okay the northern kingdom were the ten were ten tribes while the southern kingdom was judah and benjamin okay and the number and he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them three hundred thousand choice men able to go forth to war that could handle spear and shield verse six he hired also an hundred thousand mighty men of valor out of Israel for an hundred talents of silver. Now, the southern kingdom was Judah and Benjamin. The northern kingdom, which included, uh, like, um, you know, uh, Zebulun, Naphtali, Ephraim, Manasseh, Gad, that kind of stuff. Because remember, when uh, Solomon went astray, and when done messed everything up, the kingdom was divided. Okay, remember that. Again, reading verse 6. And he hired also an hundred thousand mighty men of valor out of Israel for an hundred thousand, for an hundred talents of silver. Excuse me. For an hundred talents of silver. So a hundred thousand mighty men of valor out of Israel for a hundred talents of silver. A lot of money. So he had basically a mercenary force. From Ephraim. What are you talking about? Let's keep reading. But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee. For the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. Hmm. So this army of Israel that the king hired. For a hundred talents of silver among his own uh, uh, army of 300,000 choice men. Almost half a million troops. Okay. But this hundred uh, hundred thousand were from Ephraim. And it says right there. But there came a man of God to him saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee. For the Lord is not with Israel. To wit, with all the children of Ephraim. Why? Why wasn't the Lord with him? Well, we can, we can read a little clue about that. Okay, uh, Go to Hosea. The book of Hosea. We want chapter 4 in Hosea. I'm going to read just one verse to start in Hosea, chapter 4. Hosea, chapter 4. We want verse 17. Now, in verse 7 here, it says, But there came a man of God, uh, here in Second Chronicles 25, but there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel. To wit, 
with all the children of Ephraim. Hosea chapter 4 verse 17. Why wasn't the Lord with Ephraim? Verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Hmm. Tell me something. Are you joined to idols? I don't worship a Mary statue. Uh, that's not the limitation on what an idol is. Okay. Rightfully so, when you think of idol, you think of the little Mary statue, right? Actually, the Queen of Heaven, Semiramis statue, not the scriptural Mary. But you, you think of Mary or you think of the Buddha or whatever. Yes, those are idols. But that is not what an idol is limited to. Okay? There are many things that are idols, like that idiot box, the television. Okay? There's an idol for you. Okay? Another person, a person which is a spirit, soul, and body. Hmm? Another inanimate object that is not a statue. An idea. A principle. A holy day. Yes, yes. See, the problem is uh, some people, in wanting to defend their idolatry, they limit what an idol actually is. And they say it's only one application. That's not true. Are you joined to idols? Hmm? And Hosea chapter 7 now. Hosea chapter 7, verses 8 unto verse 11. If Ryan, he hath mixed himself among the people. If Ryan is a cake, is a cake not turned. You ever made pancakes before? And then you get a phone call, you got to go run to the bathroom or something. Or you forget, and the one side is totally cooked, and the other side is raw, mm. not thoroughly cooked through or whatnot. Mm. Meaning that on one side it's cooked, on the other it's raw. Uh, meaning that, okay, Ephraim he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake, not turned, one-sided, one-sided for what his sin. Okay, strangers have devoured his strength. And he knoweth it not. Yea, gray, gray hairs are here and there upon him. Yet he knoweth not. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face. And they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. And Egypt, for us today, for our instruction in righteousness is again, Egypt is a type of this world outside your window today. Okay? They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. And if you were to read the entirety of the book of Hosea, you will learn that Ephraim was a very, well, they were very religious. But they were joined to idols. Hmm. Let's pick up now in 2 Chronicles chapter 25 at verse 8. But if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God hath power to help and to cast down. So this man of God is giving uh, Amaziah a warning here. God, uh, this man of God, who uh, during this time, the like I said, the Holy Ghost was not a permanent resident within someone, okay, as it is today. So the Spirit of God would come and go and come and go for someone. So, so anyone could be a prophet, okay? So this man of God is telling King Amaziah, hey, uh, you know those 100,000 guys that you hired? Gave them a lot of money, 100 talents of silver. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Okay? Lord wasn't with them. For the Lord is not with Israel, to the wit, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. And we just glibly uh, glanced at some of the issues that was for Ephraim. When it comes to the book of uh, Hosea, people will argue, it's like, well, when it says Ephraim, it means the entirety of the nation of Israel. It does, yes, in some context it is that way 
Yes, but it's dependent on the context in which Ephraim is being used. What we looked at was about the actual tribe of Ephraim. Of course, generally, all Israel had been fallen away, yes, but specifically, it was about Ephraim in the context what we looked at, okay? Watch out for that, okay? But the Lord is warning Amaziah, hey, God's not with these guys. And right here in verse 8, the thing is, but if thou wilt go, do it. It's like, if you don't want to take this warning and still be stubborn and go on in your proud little way, you know, be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God hath power to help and to cast down. So, warning, hey, God's not with those men you hired. And two, so far, uh, if you decide to ignore this warning and go, God's going to make you fall. Okay? So see, God is giving uh, Amaziah warning heading into battle. Hinge, hinge that, remember that. Going into battle. Okay? We are not to fight the Lord's battles the world's way. Okay? We are not supposed to do that. Hold your place here and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Very good reference here. Um, uh, let's see. Verses 1 on to verse 6. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with you, with that confidence, excuse me, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal, carne, fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, thoughts, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay? Go back to Second Chronicles chapter 25. So see, this principle, this thing of obedience, okay? Once you are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of God, um, you are going to heaven. Okay? Once saved, always saved. If you come to him on his terms, he saved you. You're once saved, always saved. For your salvation purpose. For the purpose of, of your salvation. No, you don't have to obey what the Lord says. Your life is going to be a mess. Your testimony is going to be shot. The Lord doesn't has no reason to trust us as man anyway. Isn't he even going to give you the, the speck of dirt off of the bottom of his foot? Okay? And you're going to bring shame and dishonor upon that the Lord Jesus Christ, upon that glorious name by which you are saved by our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? Yeah, you do not have salvifically. Salvifically. If he saves you, okay, no. Salvifically, you don't have to obey. No, you don't. And see, this is what the heretic and the devil hinges on. Well, doesn't matter. You're still going to be saved. But there again, like I've said to you on many a time, so then the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ means nothing to you. And you see this in a lot of my personal enemies, okay, who put on a horrible, actually, facade. You know, they can't even live up to the measure of what is called a Christian, okay? All right, but see, the easy believism heretic, well, easy believism, you save yourself by just believing. Even they, they will hinge to this truth. And it is true. It is true. It does not affect your salvation. If the Lord saves you today, if you are saved, you are sealed. 
If you are truly saved, you are sealed. You are not being held at gunpoint to obey what the scriptures say. You have to make the right choices. This is the truth. And this also is where heretics will say, well, see, once saved, always saved can't be true because look at how they're living. God's not forcing people to walk a certain way or not. Okay, We have to make the right choice to do so. Okay, You have to remember that. You have to remember that. We have to make the right choice. Okay, But see, today, pertaining to your salvation, if you are saved, you come to him on his terms. Your obedience is not going to suddenly put you into hell or cause you to lose something that you can't lose because it's not yours. Within this dispensation under the law, okay, which was faith and works, you had to have faith that God would honor the works you would do. Okay, Your faith was in what God will do in the Old Testament under the law. As today, as I've said to you before, from faith, like it says in Romans, from faith to faith. From faith from what God will do, from onto faith what God has done, it is finished. Okay? Obedience salvifically was a requirement under the law. That's why when you get heretics saying that today you have to keep the law to be saved, they're not rightly dividing the word of truth, and it's your salvation because you're the one who's got to keep it. Okay. There are those who are ignorant who teach that um, you got to keep the law. Then again, there are those certain heretics that know right what they're doing and damning people to hell. Okay. Forgive me for that little rabbit trail. Okay. But let's let's continue now. Okay. Let's read verse 8 again in 2 Chronicles chapter 25. But if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God hath power to help and to cast down. Verse 9 is very important to remember here. And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? He already paid them. He already paid the children of these children of Israel, the children of Ephraim. He already paid them. Okay? Look at the answer here. And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Okay, so this hundred talents of silver, well, I, I, what the weight of that actually is, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot. In uh, modern uh, terms, that would be a lot of money. That would be a lot of money. A lot. And Amaziah already paid them. And here in verse 9, <laughs> he, he asks, well, what about the money? Let me get the money back. What's the man of God saying? <laughs> and the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Verse 10, now, really shows something about Ephraim. And, and we looked already in Hosea, but verse 10 really is telling about these 100,000 men of Ephraim. Check this out. Then Amaziah separated them, to wit, the army that was come to him out of Ephraim, to go home again. Before we keep reading, let's, see, let's use a little logic here. A little logic. Let's say, dude hires you to do a job. Okay? Now granted, this is going to war where people could get killed easily. Okay? But, let's say a guy hires you to do a job. Pays you up front. Okay? Pays you up front. And then, when it comes down to the point to actually doing the job, the guy comes around and says, uh, hey, you know what? I don't need you. Yeah, go, go, go away. I don't need you. And as far as the money I gave you, go ahead and keep it. Now, one could argue, well, I, you know, because of morality. It's like, well, I, I didn't do what you paid me to do, so I should give it back, right? And hey, with that line of logic, right, sure, okay, fine, fine. 
But right here in the text that we just looked at, in verse 9, uh, And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. And also, with Ephraim being as they were at this time, uh, they weren't going to give back that money that he gave them anyway. So that, a, a logical argument, yes, but in context, no, it doesn't work. Okay? But, guy hires you to do a job, pays you up front, pays you handsomely, and then at the time to go and do it, he's like, hey man, you know what? I don't need you. You go, 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 go away. You know, you can keep what I gave you. Obviously. And seeing as this was in the context of going to war, where people could be killed, logically, logically, okay? You don't need, oh, okay, yeah, and I can keep, okay, fine, thank you. Say, hey, anytime I can help you, man, go ahead and call me, because I'll be right there, okay? All right? Now, again, the argument is like, well, and yes, well, I did, I personally, okay, for example, if some guy hired me to do a job, gave me the money up front, and then at the last minute says, hey, Brad, you know what? I don't need you after all. It's like, well, well you, you, you already already paid me so here take it back I would do that I would do that yes I would but see the Lord says in verse 7 for the Lord is not with Israel to wit all the children of Ephraim and we looked in Hosea uh, why because Ephraim is a cake not turn Ephraim is joined on the idols let him alone okay but logically again okay the giving it back wasn't even equated as an option because verse 9 shows that. The Lord is able to give this and give thee much more than this. So basically the Lord is saying to, uh, through this prophet, uh, to Amaziah, count that money lost, okay? Here's why. Okay, now again, logically, you get paid to do a job up front handsomely and then the guy says to you, I don't need it and you can keep it. Again, it's like, oh, okay, you don't want you don't want it back? I can give it back? No, I'll keep it. <laughs> okay, so see ya, buddy. See ya. I'm out of here, man. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, any, hey, hey. It was a pleasure doing business with you. Anytime I can help, right? Right? Logically. Logically. And no harm, no foul, right? The guy says, hey, you can keep it, you know? And... Amaziah, he, he wondered about that money, but the man of God said, don't worry about it. Logically, right? How did Ephraim act, though? Check this out. Wherefore, their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. Now, Ephraim came from the northern kingdom, okay? And as we saw already, Judah and Benjamin, which was the southern kingdom. So that ought to be telling. But they went away in great anger that they didn't go to war where some of them could have been killed. Hmm. Why was that? Because the fire was joined to idols. They were proud. And as we're going to continue to, to look at, I'm going to suggest to you there's another reason, but we're going, to, we're going to touch on that a little bit more here as we continue. But that is to be noted. They basically got a free pass and paid for their trouble, and nothing happened. Logically, and especially about verse 9, that is to be taken into the context, because Amaziah was like, well, what about the money? Man, God, don't worry about it. Kind of lost, don't worry about it. The Lord can give you more. And this is why. Because they got mad that they didn't go to war. Hmm. Hmm. Now let's continue. Let's continue. And Amaziah strengthened himself and led forth his people and went to the Valley of Salt and smote of the children of Seir ten thousand. And other ten thousand left alive did the children of Judah carry away captive, and brought them and brought them unto the top of the rock, and cast them down from the top of the rock. 
that they all were broken in pieces. So God, God told Amaziah, get rid of these people who are going to be a snare and a trap onto you, obviously, as we see in verses 9 and 10. Okay? Hence, also, that implies that there are people who, um, 1 John chapter 2, okay? There are people that will want to join themselves with you in your endeavors, okay? Who are not of us, okay? 1 John chapter 2, okay? You know, the false brethren thing brought in unawares, okay? Come on, fingers, work with me. Okay, 1 John chapter 2, okay? Uh, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Hmm. Hmm. There are a lot of people out there who are willing to join themselves onto you and even sacrifice of their own possessions and stuff to help you. But all the while they say, eat and drink and their heart is not with thee? But, okay, though, and those types of people, such as the uh, men of Ephraim, which were talked about why, why you know, God said, I'm not with them, uh, was shown us in 9 and 10. Hmm. And the Lord, okay, Amaziah obeyed. It's like, okay, I'm going to forget about it. You said so. And the Lord gave him a great victory against Seir, Edom, okay? All right? Now, verse 13. Check this out. Now, Amaziah obeyed the Lord. And remember, Amaziah, Amaziah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, verse 2, but not with a perfect heart. Here it is, verse 13. But the soldiers of the army which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah, from Samaria even on to Beth Haron, and smote 3,000 of them and took much spoil. These were the men of Ephraim that he sent away. And look what happens. They turn and they go and fall upon the cities of Judah from Samaria even unto Beth Haran and smote 3,000 of them and took much spoil. Talk about an unstable and divided heart. Yeah. You wonder why the Lord had, uh, had uh, Amaziah send these people away? Mm -hmm. Do you wonder why sometimes that certain people who might come into your life will be there for a while and then all of a sudden something will come up and then you'll see it's like, it's like, whoa, I thought you and I were like, you're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy. You're, you, you, wow, 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 you're, you're, you're off your rocker, man. Wow. Oh, and then you feel stupid because all that time, all that time, all that time, and I didn't see it. Live and learn, okay? Now verse 14. Here's the kicker. Now it came to pass, after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, God gave him a great victory, okay? That he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. <laughs> And, and, and verse 15, verse 15. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah, and he sent unto him a prophet, which said unto him, Logic here. Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? Now, hold up. Hold up. Amaziah, the Lord warned him about, you know, warned him about the children of Ephraim. 
and they, they show their true colors, okay? They, they were paid in full, and they should, they should have been either, it's like, hey, can I give it back to you? But no, the Lord said, watch this, okay? He warned them about Ephraim, okay? Warned them about Ephraim. And look at what the 100,000 guys that he, he paid repaid him, okay? There's one warning, okay? About being on the field of battle, okay? It goes, and whoops, he don't. And then the Amaziah does something really stupid. Brings back the gods of Seir, of, of Edom. And verse 15, it's like, what? What? Hold, hold on, time out. Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? That's stupid. Isn't it? And it bids the question. What was so special about these gods? What was so special about these gods? Well, for, let's answer this question. First, let's see another warning from the Torah. First five books of Moses. They call it the, some call it the Pentateuch. I refer to it as the Torah. Okay? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Verses 25 and 26. The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver oh, or gold oh, that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor, abhor extreme hatred. Check out Brother Alexander's uh, video about, are there people God, or was it something about abhor? Great video, by the way. Okay, praise the Lord. And thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Hmm. So the graven images of their gods, Okay. But they weren't to desire them for what? The silver or the gold that is on them. And Amaziah, who was given a great victory because he obeyed the voice of the Lord, got rid of the people who were obviously going to turn on him. Okay, obviously. The Lord saved his neck that way. God gives this great victory, and here this idiot, uh, void of logic and reason, goes after the gods of Seir. Why? Why? An answer. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Verses 12 on to verse 19. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and and perfect in beauty. And Satan, yea, hath God said, thou shalt not eat of every tree of the garden? Eve, yeah, God said we shouldn't eat of it. Neither should we touch it. He never said that. Boy, Satan did. No, ye shall not surely die. In the day that ye eat thereof, God doth know that your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when Eve saw that the tree was good for food, and pleasant, pleasant to the eyes. And one desire to be made wise. But but God said don't to eat, not to eat it. But it looks good. It looks good. Pleasant to the eye. And it was good for food. Fill you up. And it'll make you wise. But God said don't eat it. Ah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Look at how nice, look at how good that looks. What happened with that disobedience? It led to death. Not instantaneously. Gradually. But it led to death, didn't it? For the wages of sin is death. Because sentence against an evil man is not executed wickedly, therefore the sons of man's heart is fully set in them to do evil. One of you will put the verse in the description box, I hope. 
that's from Ecclesiastes, right? Okay. But now this King Tyrus, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in the Garden of Eden, and you thou hast been in Eden, the Garden of God. King Tyrus was not in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of God. Who was in the Garden of Eden? Well, there were four. There was God, our Father, God Himself, walking in the garden. Okay? God had His spirit, soul, and body. Okay? The Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Father, precarnate form. Okay? God the Father was walking in the garden. That's one. Adam and Eve. That's two and three. There's a fourth one. That'd be the serpent. That old devil. The, uh, the old devil. Uh, the dragon. Serpent. Satan. So there were four in the garden. Tyrus wasn't one of them. Okay? So who's being addressed here? That'd be Satan. Okay? Satan who is the driving force of Tyrus. Okay? Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond. The beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. Ooh. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes ah, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Oh, look at all those pretty little glittering stones. Oh, they look so pretty. Praise the Lord, my wife is not like this. As a lost man, have you, have, have any of you men seen some lost woman when you, when they look at, you know, you go to a jewelry store and they look at an actual diamond or something, a real life diamond or some precious stones? You ever see that sparkle in the eye? Have you ever seen anybody, when it comes to a precious stone, the look in their eyes that some people have gotten? gotten. I've, I've seen people, for example, when we, we looked at an actual real creamy jade, real jade, um, dude's eyes were like, and like, you know? Why? Because they're beautiful to look at. Oh, and they, they, oh, can make one very wealthy, can't they? But all these beautiful sardius, topaz, the diamond, the diamond, the beryl, and the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald. Oh, yes. And the carbuncle and gold. Oh, yeah. All the finest. Yes. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes. Pipes, singing. Okay. Was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. This is talking about Satan. Lucifer. Son of the morning. Not morning star. Okay? Son of the morning. Alright? He was he is created being. He is not God. Okay? Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have sent thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the mist of thee with violence. The multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the mist of thee with violence. Well, you've got precious stones like that. Gold, right? You look so beautiful. You could probably get pretty much anything you want, couldn't you? Definitely could afford it with all those precious stones, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. And thou hast sinned. Therefore will I cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Why? Verse 17. Thine heart 
was lifted up because of thy beauty. I have met women, and even some men, who are not bad on the eyes, who are good looking as it were, and they knew it. Kind of like the tale of Narcissus, you know, where we derive the word narcissism, um, where the, the tale is that he saw his reflection in the water and then he fell in love with his own reflection. But of course, what happened? He fell in and drowned. Okay. <laughs> but, okay. I have, I have encountered in my life some of, being a man, um, even when I was a sodomite, um, men and women who were good looking and they knew it. And they knew it. I, I will t and you know what this is telling you too. This here and this text we're looking at. That is one of the grotesque displays of pride. That you can. If you've never experienced that. Um, good. But when you do it. just It just makes you want to vomit. Oh, maybe not vomit, but engage in an involuntary personal protein spill, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it is one of the most disgusting things when you come across a woman or a man who are good looking and know it and have no qualms about letting you know that they know that they are good looking. It's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Hold thee. Brightness. You know, look at all those stones. You ever hold an actual stone, a precious stone to light, and the, the light glimmering, uh, gleaming through that, you know, and you turn it this way, and you turn... I've referred to scripture in that kind of uh, respect, you know, that you hold this, this precious jewel, which is above rubies, you know, the scripture. You hold a verse, a text of scripture to the light, our Lord Jesus Christ, and you turn it this way, you turn it this way, and you get another glint, and you see this kind of a facet. Same with this precious stone. Reflecting light. Bending. Bending light. A true diamond. You hold a true diamond to a light. It bends the light. You ever notice that? Hmm? Or a true crystal. Not one of the cheap ones that you can get at like a kiosk or something like that. But a true, genuine crystal. Hold that to the light. Reflects it. Also bends it. Brightness. All those pretty stones and covering. Oh, brightness. Oh, yeah. Especially when you go to, now, uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Of course, of course. Brethren, you, we've been through this before. Remember, a lot of these videos, people don't, people aren't watching the ones from even a month ago. Okay, you got to remember that. But, uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 12 on to verse 15. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Yeah. False brethren come in, brought in unawares. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verses 12 on to verse 15. As many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, go under the law, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised. Why? That they may glory in your flesh. And you read in Matthew chapter 16, um, that Satan savoreth not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Hmm. 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 Inter 
interesting. And also, too, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse, uh, uh, verses 4 and 5, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, where, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. Gain is godliness. Now, right away, like we've talked about before, when you think of gain is godliness, you think right away of money. It's so much more than that. Having multitude of sub subscribers, followers, people who will do your bidding, who will do your dirty work because you're too holy to do your own. Yeah, but you'll have little underling, novice underling of yours to do your dirty work who would lick the dung uh, between, your, uh, between your toes off if you commanded him to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gain is godliness. Uh, we, right away, we think of money. But it's more than that. Public opinion, subscribers, followers, land, your petty little kingdoms or whatever. Gain is godliness is not limited to mammon. Okay? Remember that. Remember that when you come across a channel that has over 100,000 subscribers and then boasting about how people gave $100 to his ministry. And people fall for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and why? You know, saying gain is godliness? Why, why are people like that? Why? Why, you know? Go to Romans chapter 1. You know, they glory in your flesh. You know, they, you know, uh, like it says in Matthew chapter 23 uh, about making one proselyte, and when you make them, you make them twofold more the child of hell than you are yourself like these easy believism heretics they make those who fall for their heresy ten times more the child of hell than they are themselves you know look at the look at the disciples that came from uh the inquisitor from new york okay look at the disciples that he has made they are ten times worse than he is if you can imagine okay but see, they do that so they can glory in your flesh. That they can get you away from the worship and uh, the faith of the true God, from the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Why is that? Oh, Romans chapter 1, verse 31, uh, verse 32. Uh, verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Misery loves company. Misery loves company. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. But now, again, looking back in Ezekiel chapter 28, okay? Thy, verse 17, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness with all those pretty stones and all that gold. Yeah. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And again, as we got we got a little sidetracked, okay? Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay? Picking up at verse 13. Well, see, we went through that for verse 12 because there are many people coming in saying, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Christian, by the way. Okay? I'm of the church of God, of the church of the living God. Okay? There's a difference between the two. Big difference between a Christian and someone of the church of the living God. Not going to talk about that. Got plenty of stuff where we talk about that. But see, many come in saying, oh, I'm with you. Hey, I'm with you. Kind of like the children of Ephraim that we looked at so far in 2 Corinth, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 25. Hmm? Hey, they were their brethren. They got paid in full. And they, they, they were told to go home. Hey, you can keep the money. And yet they get all irate and, and turn on Amaziah 
and then we see Amaziah Bullock in his brilliance uh, goes after the gods of uh, Edom. Oh, with all that gold and silver that was on him, huh? That shiny. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Verse 13 in 2 Corinthians 11. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Transforming appears three times within these verses. 13, 14, and 15. Transform. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15. <laughs> Okay, and note the note, note the word transform here in its variations. Transforming, right before your very eyes, transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no th great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, who has almost a hundred videos on semen retention. Yeah, yeah. Whose end shall be according to their works. And because they know that the judgment of God is against such and do such things, therefore they have pleasure in those that do the same things that they are doing. Misery loves company. But see, an angel of light and Satan, Lucifer being the son of the morning, angel of light, Oh, all those bright, glittering stones. Oh, boy. Have you ever wondered why sin looks so beautiful to you? God says not to do it, but, but look at it. Look at it. Doesn't it look beautiful? Oh, it, it'll, fill, it'll fill you up. It's good for food. It will fulfill your greed. It will fulfill your lust only for a while. You know about Tamar, Ammon, and Tamar? Um, Absalom's sister he wanted Tamar Ammon wanted Tamar and he raped her and you know that lust that you know us men are privy to to get that object of our scornful desire we get it and then it turns to hatred hmm? yeah that's the problem with lust right but yeah that, that sin God says not to do but it looks so good. Hey, it's good for food, right? It'll fulfill your, it will, will, will fulfill your right now. Okay? It's easy on the eyes. Oh, it looks so beautiful. All those, those glittering, ooh, bright, shiny stones. All that lavish, lustrous gold. And it's one to make you wise. You will be your own God. You deciding what is good and evil. Verse 18. In Ezekiel 28. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. When you get captivated by that angel of light. Which is the one that you have seen, my dear former friend. You have not seen the Lord. Okay? I hope you repent. Okay. Good luck, because you're one of the chosen ones that have seen him, and most people haven't, right? Yeah. So sad. So sad. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore wilt I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. It will come to naught. It's going to amount to nothing. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So, these idols that Amaziah saw, hmm, Go back to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 25 again. 
Okay? Looking again at verse 14. Now it came to pass after that Amaziah had come from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. Hmm. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, against Amaziah, and he sent unto him a prophet, which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? And also too, also too, go to uh, Joshua, Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. Verse 16 on to verse 21. So, now Amaziah set up the gods of Edom to be his gods. And see, that sin, not only, as we're going to see, affected Amaziah, but that sin also affected the people whom he was king over. A lot of times you think your sin might only be affecting you. Not always the case. Joshua chapter 7, verses 16 on to verse 21. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zerahites, and he brought the family of the Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man, and a Khan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah was taken, Achan, the troubler of Israel. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, oh boy, oh boy, and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold, oh, oh boy, oh boy, Huh? <laughs> yeah, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, let's refresh our memories in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 again. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it on to thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. And thou shalt utterly, but thou shalt utterly detest it. And thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. And the Lord and Joshua gave specific directions. Don't mess with anything of theirs. And also we got we got a comment on the Babylonian garment. Okay? The Babylonian garment and the gold and the silver. Oh, but we, we, we gotta we have to we have to touch on the Babylonian garment, of course, Revelation chapter 17. Okay, Revelation chapter 17. And this Babylonian garment, things of the world, signifies things of the world, which the little G God of this devil, of this world, the devil, offers you. Revelation chapter 17, verses 4 and 6. 4 onto verse 6. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Gold and precious stones and pearls. Oh, those bright glittering stones. Yeah. 
having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This is again talking about Roman Catholicism. Okay. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Mystery Babylon, Babylonian garment. The Babylonian religion, which is today modern Roman, what it was always Roman Catholicism. Babylonian garment. And, and it was a wedge of uh, wedge of silver and a wedge of gold. Yeah. Yeah. Also, too, Job 41. Job 41. Job 41. Verses 33 and 34. <laughs> oh. Oh, actually... Let's read 32 under verse 34. He maketh a path to shine after him. This is talking about Leviathan in Job 41. His scales are his pride. Okay, uh, Our Lord is veil, in a veiled way talking about Satan. That dragon, Leviathan, a dragon, a fire-breathing dragon. Okay, The red dragon is talking about Satan. But verse 32, he maketh a path to shine after him. Transformed into an angel of light. All those bright stones. Oh! Oh, they look good. Oh, they will fulfill my desire right now. Make me wise because, hey, I can decide what is good and evil. One would think the deep to be horrid. Upon earth there is not his like. Who is made <laughs> without fear. Yeah. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. So, what was what was so special about these gods back in 2 Chronicles 25, verses 14 and 15? Well, verse 14 specifically. What was it so about these gods that Amaziah, who was given this great thing by the Lord, warned of the treachery of the army of Ephraim? Warned of that. What was so special about him? Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. He was the anointed cherub. These gods, I'm sure they look very beautiful to the eyes, just like sin does. That was the trappings for Amaziah. Because we already read that his heart was not perfect with the Lord. Even though he did what was right. But his heart was not perfect. How many people do there out there that which is right, but their heart is not perfect? Not sinlessly perfect. No, God forbid. Perfect heart that loves the Lord, depends upon him, and is right with him. That belongs to him. David, he sinned, cost him plenty. But at his death, his heart was perfect with the Lord. He was a man that sought after. He went after God's own heart. He didn't have the heart of God. God forbid. No. Man after God's own heart was David. King Amaziah, though, not so. One second. Excuse me. Yes, how many people out there give great, show much love with their lips unto the Lord, but their heart is far from Him? How many? Oh, I would probably say about 90% of those who claim that they are of the Church of God, who claim to be saved. I would say about 90%. I would say about 90%. And in verse 15, the Lord warns Amaziah again. 
he, he, he warned them about the children of Ephraim. And look what happened. It turned out, praise the Lord. Verse 15 again. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah. And he sent unto him a prophet, which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people, who could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? What does Amaziah do? Verse 16. And it came to pass, as he talked with him, that the king said unto him, Art thou made of the king's counsel? Forbear. Why shouldest thou be smitten? Forbear. Shut up. Didn't want to hear it. Didn't want to hear it. You know, when things, when things that I hold, you know, when, my, when my doctrine is questioned, I go to the scriptures. It's like, okay, Lord, if I'm wrong on something, you show me through the scripture. Show me. I go to the Lord. I go to the Lord. Okay? In time, I've learned that you don't right away put up your... Unless it comes from a stupid heretic, you know, who's only there to cause trouble, who can't do anything else but that. You know, they don't count. But when someone, you know, legit... Well, what about this, Brad? It's like, okay, I'll go to the Lord. And it's like, Lord, open me the truth of the Scripture. Show me where I'm wrong. The Scripture is the final authority. Okay? But see here... Amaziah was being warned again. Twice. Twice. The second time. Warned about the children of Ephraim. Warned here twice. It's like, hey. Hey. <laughs> Why are you doing this? And what does Amaziah do? When it came to this thing about these gods that he brought back, who obviously were that forbidden fruit. Obviously. And we already looked at why. What were those? What was it about those gods that he brought back? They looked beautiful. They were appealing to the eye, to the desire, one to make wise that he obviously right because he knows what because right now let's see we're seeing the fulfillment a fulfillment of uh, the temptation. He shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. A partial, half-hearted obedience. He obeyed in one thing, was willing to part with money that he gave to people who would betray him. <laughs> But when it came to this, the prophet of God, he's like, shut up, forbear. Why should it stop be smitten? I told him, it's like, shut up or you're going to die. Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God hath determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. The wages of sin is death. So, he was obedient in the one, which panned out to be right. Praise the Lord. But when it came to the worship of other gods, Deuteronomy chapter 12, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 29 and 32, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou shalt and thou succeedest them and dwell dwellest in their land, and dwellest in their land, excuse me. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and thou and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Not looking good for our boy Amaziah here. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination to the Lord which he hateth, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters, they have burned in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. And verse 31, 
They are willing to sacrifice their own children so that they can keep their own little gods. That's the power of false gods that Satan bewitches people with. Let's keep reading. Verse 17 now. And we're going to be reading on to verse 24. And Amaziah king of Judah took advice and sent to Joash the son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us see one another in the face. Lift it up here. The wages of sin is death. Okay? God was the one who gave him a victory. He took uh, advice and took and adhered to the warning God gave him about the children of Ephraim. He adhered unto it. God brought about a victory. Came to the false gods. Hey, I don't want to hear it. Okay? So he's on his own. And Joash king of Israel sent to Amaziah king of Judah, saying, The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to my son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trod down the thistle. Now, see, God is being merciful here. We're going to see this. Check this out. Verse 19. Thou sayest, lo, thou hast smitten the Edomites, and thine heart lifteth thee up to boast. Abide now at home. Why shouldest thou mend the metal to thine hurt? that thou shouldest fall, even thou, and Judah with thee. Ah. Why shouldest thou meddle us to thy hurt? Uh, what was that? Uh, verse 16. Why shouldest thou be smitten? You see the comparison? And this warning came from God. This was the king of Israel, Joash. Joash, the king of Israel, son of Jehu. Okay? Descended from that line of Jehu. Okay? So God, even, even, in, uh, uh, even in Amaziah's defiance and wanting to worship false gods, the Lord is giving him yet another chance, the third chance. Third one. Warning about, against the children of Ephraim. Another warning about the false gods. He didn't like that. And the third one here, but Amaziah would not hear. Why? For it came of God. Saying God hardened his heart? Well, Amaziah chose what God hates. What does it say in 2 Thessalonians? Let's go there, shall we? Let's go there. What does it say in 2 Thessalonians? You know, what does it say? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I believe that is verse, oh, yeah, yes, 11 and 12. Uh, verses 10 on to 12. And with all deceivable, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause... God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And in Isaiah it talks about, you know, how they've chosen their own way, therefore I will choose their delusions. But Amaziah, verse, uh, back in uh, 2 Chronicles 25, But Amaziah would not hear, for it came of God, that he might deliver them into the hand of their enemies, because they sought after the gods of Edom. Warned twice. Warned about the false gods, didn't take it. Warned about, hey, and this king, this king of Israel is like, dude, dude, hey, you, you whooped the Edomites. Da, da, good. But bravo, uh, up the dosage, man. Uh, take another drink. Go ahead, light it up. Live it up. Great. That, that, don't, don't mess with me. I ain't, messing, I ain't messing with you. Don't mess with me. Come on, just use, use your head a little. Uh, don't mess with me. 
But he wouldn't take it. Full of pride. Because he was his own God. He chose what was good and what was evil. And he did what was right in the sight of the uh, in the eyes of the Lord. Not with a perfect heart. Not with a perfect heart. There I say unto you, it is better for you if you are legitimately warring with your flesh, struggling with sin daily, and having a perfect heart, rather, rather than you having a posh, uh, prissy little, uh, man-made, uber-clean life, yet your heart is divided, wanting to sit at the table of the devils and at the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Personally, I have more respect for someone who is struggling daily rather than someone who's like, well, I, I don't need no more repentance. Uh, I, I guess you don't, do you? Yeah. So Joash, the king of Israel, went up and they saw one another in the face, both he and Amaziah, king of Judah, at Beth Shemesh, which belonged to Judah. He was mourned. And Judah was put to the worst before Israel. And they fled every man to his tent. And Joash the king of Israel took Amaziah king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, at Bethshemesh, and brought him to Jerusalem. And break down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate 400 cubits. And look about that gold. Look about the gold. Look at this. And he took all the gold and the silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of God with Obed-Edom and the treasures of the king's house, the hostages also, and returned to Samaria. So all that stuff that he lusted after? Because we see, obviously, that Amaziah, well, the, the, the hundred, what was it, the hundred talents of silver? What about that? The Lord's like, don't worry about that. Then he saw these false gods with the gold and silver, all that. Oh, oh, all that precious stones and stuff. Oh, oh. Amaziah was a covetous man. He did things outwardly good. And yes, he even had partial obedience on things. But when it came to uh, weighty, heartfelt issues, his heart wasn't perfect. He didn't sacrifice the things of himself that was necessary. And he received three warnings, three chances. One he adhered to, and two he disregarded. And ultimately, verse 27, Now, after the time that Amaziah did turn away from following the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem. And he fled to Lachish, but they sent to Lachish after him and slew him there. So the wages of sin is death. He was warned. But he didn't take the heed. He didn't take heed. One time he did. And it, it begs you to uh, it begs you to think about that verse in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 bids me think of it anyway. Bid my, bid my brother yesterday to think of it. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 13. This one verse. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. Old and foolish king. A Messiah was not a fool. Amaziah was not a fool. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. He was foolish. He behaved. He did things as though he said in his heart, there is no God. He behaved foolishly. You know, when it gets right down to the truth of the matter, dear brethren, there are those of us in the church of the living God who... Behave foolishly. You don't, you wouldn't dare say, you don't, you know, you don't say in their heart there is no God. Absolutely not. 
but you behave foolishly. Amaziah was not a fool, but he behaved foolishly. And this was in the context of the battlefield. Okay? Context of the battlefield. Okay? Like I said, the battlefield, you know, the field of battle that we fight in. Okay? We are ambassadors for Christ, having the ministry of reconciliation and the word of re uh, reconciliation. We are not to be like the world. We are not to be like the world to win the world. Okay? We are to come out from amongst them and be separate, saith the Lord. But see, you start messing around and start using worldly measures to try to win the lost, or you, try, or you start being like the world and mingling yourself, like we read of Ephraim, who mingled himself with the strangers. Hmm? The Lord will give you a... Lord will give you chances as a, uh, out on the uh, battlefield. But see, God forbid when God's patience, patience for his children, those of the church of the living God, or his long suffering, the suffering long with the deeds of the wicked, you know, eventually God's long suffering it is going to be reached its limit. Do you realize, Church of the Living God, those of you who are dealing with sin daily, as we all do, but who are giving yourself over to it, you're making the choice to do so, God forbid you reach a point where his patience reaches its end. God forbid. God forbid. God forbid. Because heretics say, well, God's uh, grace is unlimited. And yes, yes. But you can only play around with the Lord so long until he, his long-suffering has a limit. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. God's patience has a limit. It's called being handed, uh, handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus and or the redemption of the purchased possession. How many of you have been warned and you've before, you've heeded God, but yet when it comes to that, that idol of yours, that false little G God, whatever that may be, that you don't want to hear it. I've, I've encountered that many a time, you know. Again, a perfect example of this little G-God thing here about verse uh, uh, 14 in Second Chronicles 25. Someone who's willing to be with you thick and thin. And then when a uh, question about being uh, diligent reading the scriptures and then about God actually appearing to you, forbear. Why would you be smitten? How many times have you been warned? And this is on the field of battle. This is on the field of battle. Okay? The context what we have is on the field of battle. God will give you warning. Hey, you're going in the wrong direction. Get away from it. If not, you're warned. Hey, Amaziah, and this is the Old Testament. Amaziah got three warnings. He adhered to one, paid off well, got a great victory, but then, whoop, down the toilet. Yeah, uh, like uh, one brother John likes to say, uh, there's no going back. You're either in here or you're either out. You're either going to do what he says or you're not. You're not being forced to, remember. Okay? You not doing what God has said ain't going to cost you your salvation, which these heretic, easy believism scum like to cling to. No, it's not. But you're dragging the name of our Lord through the mud. 
God knows your heart, right there, old chap? Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, okay? You know, when you come across people like this, you know, um, Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. And we cover what subversion is in our response onto words to no profit, which will be in the description box of this video. See, and that's in context to the battlefield. At the battlefield. But now I want us to, uh, to ponder another incident about we knowing our place. Okay? About we knowing our place. Now we're going to look at Second Chronicles, chapter 26. Okay? And we are going to be looking at Uzziah. King Uzziah. Yes. Yes. King Uzziah. The son of Amaziah. King Uzziah. Yes. Chapter 26 now. Well, oh, one second, brother. Sorry about that. Yes, King Uzziah, who was raised up to reign in the stead of his father Amaziah. Let's read a little about Amaziah, or Uzziah. Yes. Uh, let's begin... Um, Oh, let's begin at verse 3. Let's begin at verse 3. Sixteen years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned fifty and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah did. Okay? According as his father Amaziah did. Mm. Mm. And he did that, oh uh, yeah. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Yes, yes. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of, Ga of Gath and the wall of Jebna, and the wall of Eshtad, and built cities about Eshtad, and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines, and against the Arabians that dwelt in Gerubal, in Gerbal, excuse me, and the Mehunims, Mehumen, Mehunims, excuse me. And the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad, even to the entering in of Egypt. For he strengthened himself exceedingly. Yes, and why is this? Verse 5. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, Lord, God made him to prosper. To prosper. That holds true for today. You're, you're saved, born again, converted, you're going to heaven, no matter what, okay? But if you choose to neglect and not to obey what God has said, how are you going to, how are you going to put forth our Lord Jesus Christ? Remember, you are called to the ministry of reconciliation. You are called to be an ambassador. And when you're living like the world, how... How is the Lord supposed to use you when you won't do the least of what he says? Huh? He can. Yes, he can. But does his honor mean anything to you? Let's continue. Verse 9. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the turning of the wall and fortified them. And he built towers in the desert and digged many wells. For he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains. 
husbandmen also, and vine dressers in the mountains, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands, according to the number of their count, by the hand of Jeel, the scribe, and Maziah, the ruler, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were two thousand and six hundred, and under their hand was an army. Three hundred thousand and seven thousand and five hundred, a lot of people, that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for them with throughout all the throughout all the host, shields and spears and helmets and hemorrhagens and bows and slings to cast stones. He made in Jerusalem engines, invented by cunning men, to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks, to shoot arrows and great stones withal. So see, when it came in the context of the battlefield, here Uzziah, here Uzziah, spot on. But we didn't finish reading in verse 15, did we? No. No, we didn't. Yeah. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks and to shoot arrows and great stones withal. Yes! And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped he was strong. There are many people out there who are strong right now. And the help that they are getting is because they are manipulating people. Because they know how to manipulate people in order to give them money. Manipulating by uh, the multitude of subscribers or buying subscribers or something like that. Apparently you can buy views too, which makes no sense to me. Why would anyone want to do that when in a, in a blink of an eye, YouTube for whatever reason can remove views? Why would someone want to do that? It makes no sense to me. But there are many people out there who appear to be strong. But see, they are strong because they are the ones keeping it afloat. Yes, and his name spread far abroad, and he was marvelously helped till he was strong. What happened after what he thought he was strong, when he was strong? <laughs> okay, his father, Amaziah, when he got strong, he went and brought in the gods of uh, uh, Edom. Okay, they were his downfall. They were his downfall. Absolutely. And he didn't want to hear what God had to say about it. Didn't want to hear it. Threaten the prophets, like, forbear. Why should I stop be smitten, right? Amaziah didn't do it that, but what did he do? He didn't bring out a God, uh, a little idol, no. But what was Satan's temptation in the garden? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Meaning you are uh, you know enough to decide what is good and what is evil when you at man you as man at your best you don't know what truly is good and what is truly is evil only one does and that is who God and how do you find that out through the scriptures no you go to twits like Bible is mark of beast and they tell you eh, yeah right they're leading you to hell only God knows what is truly good and what is truly evil it is Satan. That, tell, that tells you, hey, you can know what is good and what is evil. So while Uzziah didn't openly set up like the idols as his father Amaziah did, but he did go after another god. Oh, he sure did. Verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction which we already looked about in Ezekiel. His heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Which was very bad. Very bad. Uh, what had happened was, 
exactly this. This is this is the idolatry. This is what Uzziah here, what happened to Uzziah. Now, I'm not going to at first read you what we're reading. Hopefully you'll pick this up. <laughs> How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Okay, okay. Isaiah 14, verses 12, on verse 15. Some of you don't know what know about this, so beg your pardon. For thou hast said in thine heart, Lucifer, that old serpent, the dragon, Satan, Lucifer, okay? Uh, son of the morning, okay? Son of the morning, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, not morning star, okay? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Second Chronicles 26, verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. See, now this differs from the um, context of the battlefield. Okay? This was King Uzziah taking upon him something that was not ordained for him to do. And note here in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15, Yet thou, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Suddenly, because he was strong and all these good things were going on for him, he all of a sudden thought that he could go ahead and worship and offer incense unto the Lord. Hmm. Hmm. And see, this is in context of something of the house of God, okay? And remember, this is a different dispensation, okay? Now, right away, you might think of like, well, okay, so he was the king going to offer incense. It wasn't for the king to do that. We're going to look at that. But you got to remember, too, for us today, now, t for us today, in this dispensation, if you are saved, born again, converted, you are sealed until the day of redemption. Every single one of you is in the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? Ministry of reconciliation. Having the word of reconciliation, you are an ambassador for Christ. Okay? You are an ambassador for Christ. Every single one of us. But you, you do got to remember, okay, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Not everybody, even though we are all in the ministry of reconciliation, okay? We all have different functions within the body of Christ today, okay? What God has called me to do is not what he has called you to do, okay? But yet we are all in the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse uh, 27 on to verse 31. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, if you are truly saved, born again, converted, obviously. If you're not saved, this has nothing to do with you. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues, diversity of language. And the charismatics make the tongue sting the most important. And that's not at the bottom of the list. But see, there's distinction there. We're all within the ministry of God. But God has called some of us to different functions within the body of Christ. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet, 
shew I unto you a more excellent way. And that is the way of charity, self-sacrifice. Okay? We're all in the ministry of reconciliation. We are. But he has called us to different, different purposes. And see, the big thing is, this is for us today in this dispensation. Okay? There is no priest class today. Okay? The priesthood of the believer is that you personally can go to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, to him personally. You don't need a priest. Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man. Not Mary. Okay? Not your Roman Catholic Jesuit priest. Not your pastor at your church building. Okay? You can go to the Lord personally. Different dispensation. When this, in Second Chronicles, chapter 26, this is when the priest class was in operation under the dispensation of the law. Okay? So, to say, to say, well, why couldn't have Amaziah do that? you got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. Okay? God was in no way unjust for what he did to Uzziah here, excuse me, to Uzziah here, which we are going to look at. Because he had allotted a certain specific duty onto the Levites to do what Uzziah, in his pride, thinking that he was God, that he can do it, because his heart was lifted up. Okay? In that pride, he thought he could do it. But no, he couldn't. And unlike the battlefield, where you will be warned or given a multitude of chances and stuff like that. Um, when it comes to something like this, we need to know our place. We need to know that we are not God. Okay? We are not God. There are some out there who are preaching and teaching that have no business doing so. Okay? None. Fortunately, the Lord has used me to rebuke a few of them. Okay? Why? Because you're going to be held at a greater standard and account for what you have ta uh, taught. No, we're all going to be judged, excuse me, we're all going to be judged by the same standard. But see, I, at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to have to give an account for everything I have taught. And I have confidence on my Lord, Jesus Christ, that what I have taught you is from him. And I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Okay? But see, we need to know. We need to know our place. That we are not God. We need to know our place. Because look what happens, okay? This, remember, as we, we talked about in the beginning, this is for our instruction in righteousness. Verse 17. In Second Chronicles chapter 26. Then Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests, fourscore, two, four, six, eight, eighty people. Okay? Yes. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. There's the warning. Okay? There is the warning that Uzziah got. And about what they are talking about, okay, about that, Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. See, a different dispensation. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? But there again, to instruct us in righteousness, there are some people out there who are doing things, doing things that they ought not to be doing and claiming that they're doing it for the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name. Unto this day, wherefore, Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, according as the Lord thy God promised him. And as uh, Azariah the priest said unto Uzziah, Hey, this isn't for you, okay? This is our job. Yes, you're king, but you're doing something that you're not supposed to do. 
That was the only warning Uzziah got. Now look what happened. Verse 19. Then Uzziah was wroth. Hold, hold on before we continue. Was wroth. I, I'm the king. Who, who, what, what? You, can, you got time for me to tell you how about the great things that I have done for the Lord? Huh? Yeah? Take a look around at all that I have done for the Lord. I'm king. I'm, upon, I'm the anointed one. I'm a chosen one. Who are you? I'm the king. I could have you put to death. Who are you? Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. So the warning that he got in verse 18, did he heed to it? And while he was wroth with the priests, now see, his father, his father, Amaziah, when the prophet came to him, uh, warning him, he said, forbear, why should it stop be spitting, was in the context of the battlefield. This is in the or, uh, context of the house of God, specifically what God has said for the worship under this dispensation of the law that this was written under, okay? That's very specific. And here Uzziah, in his pride, thought that he could do otherwise. Oh, oh, oh. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, because he got angry, God, was, God gave him a chance. But the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the altar. So the Lord warned him. He did get a warning. But unlike Amaziah, his father, which did have time, he was given just very little time. It's like, okay, you're getting one warning. If you don't do this now and take off, you're going to get it. Okay. The, the warning was a little bit more stern and the consequence for what he did was immediate. Unlike with his father, Amaziah, which was a gradual thing. You see? And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him and behold, he was leprous in his forehead and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, he himself Hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. Yeah, they're like, Dude, you, come on! And he's like, oh, ho, ho, ho! Yeah, by then it was already too late. You mess around with God. You mess around with God. Especially doing things that aren't pertinent for you to do when he has told you otherwise. Be careful, friend. You gotta be very careful. Because also another example of this, okay, another example of this that we can look at is um uh first chronicles chapter 13. First Chronicles chapter 13. A very similar thing to this. Okay, first chronicles chapter 13, um uh, verses 9, verses 9 on to verse 14. Okay, this is about the Ark of God. When it was uh, in, uh, by, let's read. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Kidon, Yuza put forth his hand to hold the Ark, for the oxen stumbled. David wanted to bring the Ark of God to a place that he had prepared for it. Okay, that's the context. And he put the Ark on a cart. He was doing the right thing. He wanted to bring the ark to this place that he had prepared for it. But he did it the wrong way. And because they had put the ark in, an, uh, in a cart with the oxen, okay? And when they came onto the threshing floor of Kedon, Yuza put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. 
the oxen stumbled and he's like, whoa, you know, innocently enough. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Yuza. And he smote him because he put his hand to the ark. And there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Yuza. Wherefore that place is called Perez. That's what breach means, Perez. Or Perez means breach. Yuza to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. So he put the, the ark on the cart and because that, and he wasn't supposed to do that. His intention was good. He wanted to bring the ark to him, to the place that he prepared for it. But he didn't do it the right way. i show you that, okay? Um, go to um, chapter 15 now, verses 1 and 2. Uh, chapter 15 in First Chronicles, verses 1 and 2. And David made him houses in the city of David, and prepared a place for the ark of God, and pitched, a, pitched for it a tent. And David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God, and to minister unto him forever. So see, he was doing the right thing the wrong way. And it cost him. Same principle. We are to know our place. It is not for us, even of his body, to usurp the place of God in people's lives or to go against what he has specifically said for us today. We need to know our place. Do you know your place? At the feet of Jesus Christ? What can we take away from these two men that we just looked at today? Well, obedience today doesn't affect your salvation. Okay? And it doesn't. You could, the Lord can save you, and you can be genuinely saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus, and decide not to do anything that God says in the scripture and still go to heaven. Your life is going to be a wreck, but you will still be saved. Like I had talked about earlier. The easy believism devils harp on that. Hence bringing the true God's name uh, through the mud. Okay? But salvifically, no. It doesn't, it doesn't affect your salvation. It affects the Lord's honor. Is that not enough for you? But see, under the dispensation of the law, obedience was a requirement for salvation. And salvation wasn't a guarantee under the Old Testament, under the law. Both these men were warned. And both these men who were godly men paid a price for their disobedience. Consider today, how many warnings have you been given? Are you heeding them? Are you playing around with God? Are you taking chances that you don't have the liberty that you think you have? God warned you and you're not taking it seriously? Or are you deceiving yourself thinking that God's um, patience with his body and his long suffering is endless? Uh, God's patience for those of, the, of his body, the church of the living God, his patience can be brought to an end and he could kill you. Like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I believe it's actually verse 5 to hand someone over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And then when you stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, yeah, you're going to be in heaven, but he's going to be ashamed of you for eternity. You want that stigma? These are the things I want us all to consider going into this weekend. And if there's stuff that the Lord has warned you about... How many chances are you going to get? 
You think you're saved because you had, you know, you had an indwelling of the Holy Ghost <coughs> and you spake with blah, 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 blah. How many chances do you think you're going to get? Oh, 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 you think you're saved because God appeared to you. How many chances do you think you're going to get, man? I can't even imagine that. Dying and going to the great white throne and saying, well, you appeared to me. I did not. I can't even imagine that. By the time at the great white throne, it's too late. It's like, well, I was stupid. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. But by then, it'll be too late. Your obedience... For to today in this dispensation it's not a requirement for your salvation okay you you do have to obey yes you do you have to come to him on his terms okay right there and so many want to boot the door out of the way and shout through the crack their heresy and lies climbing up some other way they're not saved okay you have to come to him on his terms okay you do. You have to come to him on his terms. There's no other way to be saved but the way that he has chosen. And you have to go to him on his terms. You go to him on his terms. He saves you. You're not being forced. You're not being forced to obey. You're not. Don't you wish you were sometimes, right? Right? Yeah, amen. Amen. But see, God would, that would mean God would have robots. God doesn't want a robot. God wants men. And that, that includes you women as well. Mankind, you're a woman of man, taken out of man, okay? Get over it, okay? God doesn't want a robot. He wants you. And yes, you can be saved. And totally disregard all this and still go to heaven, but you're going to be the lowliest in heaven there ever will be. Think about this. Muse. Think upon this today as you walk with the Lord. Contemplate it through the scriptures. How many warnings, how many chances have you got? Hey, you. Look at me. This might be your last chance. What are you going to do with it? I hope you do what the Lord wants you to do. That's going to be it for this video. This was not the video that I had intended. Again, I... The, the, the Lord, the, there's this video about why the authorized version is superior to the Greek and Hebrew. Oh, oh you know, people like even Eric John Phelps said that that's heresy to say that the authorized version is superior to the Greek and Hebrew. These Jesuit trained cemetarian guys, would you say that uh, the scriptures are superior to the Greek and Hebrew? They're, they're ready to kill you. They're ready to stone you. That's almost as bad to them as doing this to their trinity. <laughs> yeah, I spit on the trinity. You saying that the, uh, the authorized version is superior to the Greek and Hebrew to some of these people? You'll see it. Heresy! Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's something that's in the mist. But that's apparently not yet. Not yet. I've tried, but uh, not yet. And this video that was given today, given last night, uh, my, my, my best friend and I, we sat, I, I sat right here. He was over where he was in Missouri. And the Lord just opened up the scriptures and it was just, just like that. Fellowship between the saints of those like-minded. And to be honest with you, and my wife, uh, that my wife goes without saying, okay? She is my bone and my flesh, 
Okay, my wife is my bone in my flesh. That's why I'm not mentioning her because that's a given. But I have truly no one other than my dear best friend who I'm as like-minded with as he. We are incredibly like-minded. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So, But uh, the Lord opened up the scriptures for the both of us and here this is. So, Hopefully, hopefully this will help some of you give you something to think about. And this, this video is a stepping stone for the video that will be coming on Monday, Lord willing. Monday, the 4th of July. Yeah. 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 Big video on Monday, Lord willing. Lord willing. Going to probably make a lot of uh, my countrymen mad at me again for talking about our Jesuit nation. Anyway, that's going to be it. I'm going to get this uploaded. Thank you so much for watching this. If you do, I hope this, uh, the Lord be glorified. The Lord be glorified. Thank you. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you. We love you. And we will see you in the next video next Monday, Lord willing. Bye-bye.